Good afternoon, everyone. This is the pediatric retina section. I'm Phil Ferrone, and it's Mike Tracy. And I'd like to introduce uh, Bob Avery, who will speak to us about anti-VEGF safety and ROP. Thank you, Phil. May I have any slides, please? It's my pleasure to speak about this. Thanks to the, uh, the organizing committee to let me uh, talk about this. These are my disclosures. I consult for all the anti-VEGF uh, companies, and all these drugs are off-label for retinopathy prematurity. This is a particularly difficult uh, subject to assess the safety in. The Corcoran analysis done last year uh, didn't, it was not able to really assess how the safety is long-term in these drugs. Um, there are several papers that have been published, particularly in the uh, pediatric literature, including this one, which found a threefold increased risk of neurodevelopmental delay or impairment in patients who receive bevacizumab instead of laser. Now, these studies that are retrospective have a bias for the sicker babies often being treated with Avastin or with bevacizumab instead of uh, laser because that's easier to do in a sick baby in the clinic. And so this bias pervades through most of the retrospective studies. This is a second study around the same time that found a similar heavy trend towards uh, more uh, neuro neurodevelopmental delay in patients treated with bevacizumab. But again, it suffers from the same bias. Some authors have tried to address this bias. A prospective study done by Darius it would take a lot more patients to be able to come to a conclusion. And so that's really hard to do, especially in a single center. Um, Michael Blair had a good idea in trying to assess before and after the VEGIT ROP study what their institution was doing. And for the 40 patients right before the VEGIT ROP study was published, they were all treated with laser. He compared those to the 46 patients treated right after the study when only intravitreal bevacizumab was being given. And so comparing those two cohorts retrospectively, uh, there was no real difference in death or cerebral palsy or in the developmental delay scores that were measured. That's one way of trying to get rid of that bias, but it's still a retrospective study. There has been a recent prospective study looking at a case control type study prospectively looking at three groups, patients that don't have ROP, patients that have ROP that's too mild for treatment, or patients that had ROP and received a bevacizumab injection. And their primary outcome was the neurodevelopmental delay. Um, there was no significant difference uh, when you exclude patients with poor visual outcome because these are different groups. And uh, there was sort of a adjusted odds ratio of 4.6, which is for cognitive development, which is one of the hot buttons for the types of developmental delay that one can get. Um, but this uh, study did not find any significant difference, uh, although they did say there's a, a small possibility of a clinically significant uh, difference given a bigger trial being done. Of course, this is only 31 patients in one arm and 39 in the other. A much larger patient uh, population was evaluated in this retrospective analysis of a prospectively conducted study where these 18 centers in the National Institute of Child Health uh, were prospectively gathering data on all the preterm infants that were treated for ROP. And so here we have over 400 patients in this study recently published in uh, pediatrics. And the primary outcome was either death or neurodevelopmental delay. And let's take a careful look at the uh, patients in this study because, again, even though it's prospectively collected, uh, there can be a difference between these two groups. And indeed, there was a statistically significant difference in the in the, both the birth weight and the gestational age, although small differences. The mean difference was only about a day in the gestational age and 20 grams in the birth weight, but this is just the mean, I'm sorry, just the median uh, area. And the very light babies, very low weight babies could have uh, potentially had more uh, laser, uh, I mean, more injection than laser given. But there's pretty good balance with other things, uh, such as intraventricular hemorrhages, the uh, aspects that they use to measure the lung function, Interestingly, there was more patent ductus treatment in the uh, laser surgery arm. And the oxygen, there was a longer treatment with oxygen in the injected group, but that was uh, after uh, the injections are given, so it's not quite the same relevance. Their outcomes were interesting, and the primary outcome was either neurodevelopmental delay or death. It just trended towards there being something, but no statistical difference. But when they looked at death alone, there was a high, um, highly significant two-and-a-half-fold increased risk of death in this population that received the injection. Again, there could be a bias towards patients receiving 
the injection if they were sicker. But they looked at this with a sensitivity analysis where they looked at the 12 centers that did not use both uh, laser and injection. So it was either one or the other, similar to what we saw in the Blair patient paper, but this is prospectively. And so in this analysis, you had 80 patients in each arm, and only laser surgery is done or injection is done in those centers. And they still found this two and a half fold increased death rate, and it still uh, remains statistically significant. Uh, so these authors were quite concerned, and uh, because of this per persistent finding in the sensitivity analysis, and have called for a rigorous appraisal of the risks and benefits in a randomized perspective trial fashion and uh, warned against using the drug in this point. So uh, it's interesting. I went back and looked at the BRP study, and the same two-and-a-half-fold increased risk of death was present there. But of course, this is very small numbers and not statistically significant. So what do we have? We have really no conclusive proof. We got a different opinion from what's in the literature in ophthalmology journals versus what's in the pediatric journals. But none of these studies are really published to uh, another, none of these studies are powered to determine a problem uh, that's uncommon like death. And so we just need a bigger in, more patients, more randomized trials, hopefully, which may come with studies in, uh, ongoing from companies investigating these medicines. And uh, we don't really know right now uh, if there is some risk or not. We think it's probably small, but it could be real. Um, at present, though, there are two options I find very reasonable while you're waiting in this period of uncertainty, and that's lowering systemic exposure either by drug choice or by dosing choice. Jerry Letty published his paper several years ago looking at a flibercept in a canine model where the eye of ROP, where the eye is the same as in a human, and he used five microgram doses and was able to get rid of all the retinal neovascularization. That's one four hundredth the adult dose. And in the higher doses, he had this impairment in retinovascular genesis, uh, but the five microgram dose was the best. Well, we've seen evidence, Wallace has shown using lower doses of Avastin or Bevacizumab uh, for ROP. The lowest dose they tested in this dose de-escalation study was 31 micrograms, or 1 40th of an adult dose, and nine of nine eyes had resolution of the vessels at one month, and in longer-term follow-up, none of those eyes recurred. So we know lower doses can work. That's one option to try to reduce systemic risk. The other is changing the drug. We know from many papers that uh, Bevacizumab has a long exposure. It reduces the VEGF. And ROP, this study showed three months of reduced VEGF, where ranibizumab really doesn't do that. Um, and there are studies prospectively showing the benefit of ranibizumab in this condition with lower doses actually having better vascularization. So to summarize, anti-VEGF therapy has been shown to be extremely helpful for ROP. I'm not a hater of anti-VEGF and ROP. But there's conflicting evidence in the literature as to how safe it is long term. And until we have those larger studies, especially prospective ones, hopefully, I think it's safe to use a lower dose of bevacizumab or change to a drug with lower systemic uh, exposure, such as ranibizumab or brosilumab. This is my personal opinion, but thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bob, for an excellent talk.